I'd, I'd like to thank you, everyone for that helped and everyone that was patient with me. So here's your buzzwords. Keep score, we talked about. Now, like I said, I'm gonna talk a lot about our community. Uh, the main site is uh, donkeycar.com. So um, there's the GitHub with 100% of the source code uh, at GitHub Autorope Donkey Car. And our community is donkeycar.slack.com, very active community. So who is Donkey Car? The originators of Donkey Car are Adam Conway and Will Roscoe. Um, they came at it from different points of view. One of them was interested in, in, in encouraging uh, public transit by expanding availability through autonomy and things like that. The important part is it's sort of grassroots from the ground up approach to autonomy as opposed to giant corporations spending billions of dollars on the way down. Um, there's currently four committers on the team. I'm one of them. Tom Kramer is our intrepid leader. Um, community, community, community. Uh, we're also closely aligned with a group called uh, DIYRobocars.com, and they are, are also dedicated to innovation at the grassroots of autonomy, and they're the ones that run the races that we do, and th there's some good footage of some races I'll be showing you. So who here is a builder? Who here you know, uses Raspberry Pi or an Arduino or knows how to 3D print and laser cut? So a so decent, decent number of folks. I imagine everybody's a programmer. Who here is a programmer? That was correct. That's everybody. Uh, and who has done machine learning or data science? And we have a few, yeah, about the same number as builders. Okay, good. Um, so let's jump right in. What do you need to actually get started to build one of these things at a high level? So the entire build of materials, including the car, is about $250. So it's, it's very sort of accessible. Uh, so you need a host PC, Mac, Windows, Linux, um, because you're going to crunch your data on that PC. It's more capable than a Raspberry Pi. You're going to need an electric radio control car. This particular car is one of our kind of standards. Um, we, on on uh, docs.donkeycar.com, we talk about three specific cars, only because the committers have used those cars, and we've We've documented that they work really well, but really, I'll go into the anatomy of what one of these cars is, and you can use any one of them that fits, fits the bill. This particular one is $80. It's very inexpensive, and you don't, you don't build this. It's ready to run out of the box. The only thing you do is take the top off and put your stuff on. So you need a computer. Um, this one is using a Raspberry 4. Prior, I used a Raspberry 3. Um, and you can also use an NVIDIA Jetson Nano, which is a new uh, single board computer from NVIDIA that includes a 128 core GPU on it. Um, and we have instructions on, on how to use those three boards. Um, you also need a way to get the control signals to the steering and to the uh, motor, the DC motor. And we use this little device here, it's called a PCA9685. It, and it talks through a serial protocol to the computer, and the computer says, hey, put out this level of control on this channel, and this level of control on this channel. And it just off-boards handling um, these square wave control signals, and it does it very well. And it's very, literally the thing's like four bucks. You get two of them for eight bucks on Amazon. You'll have them tomorrow. Uh, you're going to need a camera. The only sensor on my car is a camera. It drives autonomously with just the camera. So in that sense, it's exactly like a Tesla. <laughs> <laughs> then you need a chassis to mount all these parts, right? And, and this is 3D printed, and this is laser cut. And you can get a 3D printed one of these, too. The, the, the actual uh, uh, files for printing these things are open source. But if you don't have a 3D printer, you can just order them on, at the donkey car store, and they'll, they'll send you a kit with all the screws and everything. And, you don't have to worry about that part either. Uh, and then you need a wireless gamepad. So PS3, PS4, Xbox One, uh, Logitech F710 is another one that has its own little Logitech dongle, so it doesn't even use Bluetooth. But it, the important thing is wireless, because this thing's going to be driving around. You don't have to run after it. Uh, you're going to need the instructions. Those are at docs.donkeycar.com. Uh, you're going to need the code, because you're going to clone that thing. 
to start off. And so that's that auto rope uh, donkey car and GitHub. And then you're going to need our awesome community. They will help. Um, they're extremely responsive. The community is extremely responsive. It's very, very common to ask a question and within five minutes have an answer. So it's a very active community. So the first time I actually ever tried was about three years ago after seeing a talk at QCon by Adam Conway and, and, and Will Roscoe. And so I bought everything and I put it all together as part of an Innovation Days project at my company. And then I had it drive around the cube farm at, at my company. So this is actually my very first attempt. It's driving itself. So the corners are actually the scary bits, right? Like straightaways are not that hard. So, you know, I'm holding my breath hoping I get to a corner. And also the battery's running out at this point too. I did a lot of training. There it goes around the corner. Okay, so I can tell you I let out a tremendous cheer. Uh, but that's to illustrate that uh, uh, this grassroots autonomy, it's not rocket science. It's very accessible. So, okay, so let's talk about the anatomy of an RC car and how to take a ready to run RC car and turn it into a donkey car capable autonomous vehicle. So like I said, I, I bought mine at nitrorcx.com. It was like 80 bucks. I'll make this uh, uh, publicly available afterwards too. So uh, anatomy, of, uh, so, and then you just take off that little plastic thing and then it starts to actually look a lot more like a robotics platform, right? It's just that one little piece of plastic and all of a sudden like, oh yeah, that looks like a robot. And <clears throat> the important aspects of this, and these are the things that you need to have if you buy something other than the three that we talk about. Um, there's a servo. Servo is a kind of a motor where you can give it a control signal. It, it will position itself at a certain position. So you can say, go left you know, 45 degrees, go right 15 degrees, and it'll position itself. That's, that's uh, set up with a linkage to the front wheels, and that's what turns, turns it. So you can send it a control signal and tell it to turn. The DC motor is a, is a it, this, in this car, it's a brush DC motor. It's good at slow speeds, which it's a race, so maybe that's not important, but early on it was important to me. And then this thing here, the ESC, uh, so that's this little doohickey here. That's electronic speed controller. Um, that outputs the control signals to the steering servo and, and voltage to the motor, so the motor goes at the right speed. Uh, the receiver in an RC car is the thing that takes the, uh, the radio waves from the, from the controller, turns them into those control signals, and hands them to the ESC so they get to steering and, uh, and throttle. And then you need a battery. And you need a better battery than the one that comes with it. Uh, this, this is fine to get started with. This is nickel metal hydride. One of your first upgrades will be get a lithium polymer battery. It'll, it, it has a better... Uh, discharge curve and, and will last longer. So you need these things. Um, and so schematically, so not that particular car, but schematically, you, your car comes with its radio controller and it talks 2.4 gigahertz radio to the RF receiver. And then the receiver on one channel sends a square wave to control the throttle and on another channel sends a square wave to control the steering. And those are called uh, pulse width modulation uh, signals. So it sends those to the electronic speed controller, which then routes the steering PWM to the servo, which takes PWM natively, and then, uh, and then uh, uses an H bridge to turn the control signal into, into power for the DC motor to decide, and also direction for the DC motor, because these things can go in reverse. So that's sort of the schematic of an RC. So the parts you really need is you need this separate electronic speed controller from receiver. The cheaper uh, radio control cars, they save money by building this as one unit. And when you build it as one unit, you can't take control at this level. So your car needs to have a separate receiver from the ESC. Because I'll show you a little bit of while, we don't need the receiver anymore. We're not going to use it. 
So we need to be able to hook in at that level. And this, these, are the, these are the control signals, PWM. Uh, and and it's, about, it's about a 50 hertz loop, um, and the control signals at a minimum one, one millisecond, and at a maximum two milliseconds. So one millisecond means zero, two milliseconds means 100%, and therefore 1.5 milliseconds, like right in the middle. So if you gave it 1.5 milliseconds, it says it's drawing, driving straight, or it's sort of stopped. Um, and if you give it a two millisecond, then it's going all the way to the right, or full uh, throttle. And the reason this matters is because we need to have the Raspberry Pi now create these signals. So the way that we do that is we need to take control of the motor and steering. We're going to replace that receiver piece. Um, we're, going to, we're going to create another way to generate the PWM signals that go into the electronic speed controller. And there's uh, several ways that people do this. There's this PCA. Uh, Actually, it's 9685, not 9586. Uh, servo board controller. You could do with an Arduino, if you're used to Arduino. Um, or with a Raspberry Pi, you can directly control it through the headers on the Raspberry Pi. And people have done all of these things. I'm going to talk about using that servo board because it's like four bucks and it produces a rock solid square wave signal. It's very easy to use. All right, so these are the parts that we're going to lose. We don't care about this. We don't care about the RF receiver. So, when we do that, we're going to be left with a car that has electronic speed control about any of that stuff. And then, so then we're going to take this, see, look at that, it's right, 9685, see that? PCA 9685 looks like this, right? So it's got a bunch of pins. These pins here are for communication and power. These pins here are for sending those PWM signals to the servo and the throttle. So we're going to add one of these. That's this little board right here. So we're going to add this $4 part here. Then we're going to add the Raspberry Pi. Or we're going, to, we're going to add either a Raspberry Pi. The ones that are sort of standard are Raspberry Pi. It's the most common. Then the Jetson, uh, the Jetson Nano. The NVIDIA Jetson Nano is a new um, single board computer. And it has a GPU on it. And a lot of people have moved, especially if they have bigger cars, they've moved to that. And they, they have the ability to do a lot faster inference because of the GPUs. So you're going to add a computer. In this case, it's a Raspberry Pi. And now the Raspberry Pi needs to talk to this board. Um, and you can see a bunch of wires here. That's the communication piece. There's a, a, there's a serial protocol that chipsets use to talk to each other called IC2, uh, or IC squared. And uh, it's a serial protocol with channels that thing can identify itself as a channel. And basically, you just send a, uh, a serial command to it. And it takes that command and does uh, what it needs to. And we're sending it set this PWM value on this channel, set this PWM value on this channel, and then it'll generate those PWM values. And then we've got these wires here that go from, from, uh, from uh, the bus on this side back down to the ESC. So Raspberry Pi tells this thing to generate PWMs. It generates the PWMs, and then it goes down into uh, the ESC. Okay, so now we've got compute. We've got a way to uh, generate the PWMs. Now we want to be able to drive this thing around, you know, and not have to run around after it. So we just use a regular gamepad. So a PS3, PS4, Xbox One, the Raspberry Pi has Bluetooth built into it. And so you can pair, all of those are Bluetooth devices. You can pair those directly with the Raspberry Pi uh, through Linux. Uh, they, they end up as uh, input slash JS0. Uh, and then, then you talk in a standard way to them. Uh, the Nano doesn't have Bluetooth built in by default. You have to add a, uh, like a Bluetooth uh, USB uh, dongle to do that. So now we have a way. Yes? If it's driving itself, why do you need a controller? I don't get this. Okay. So the question is, if it's driving itself, why do I need a controller? And we'll get to that very shortly. But the, the short thing is, we use a technique called behavioral cloning, where when you where we record an expert, a human, driving, and then we try to drive like the human. So we need to record your driving. So you're going to drive it around using that controller. And then the final thing is the camera. The only sensor on a standard stock donkey car is just a camera. It's a wide angle camera. So this one's 160 degrees. So you can try to get both sets of lines in when you're driving on a track. 
but that's the only that's the only sensor we used uh, for as as in the base build. Okay, so now we've we put this all together and it takes two three hours to put this all together. That's all. No soldering. You can see it's all basically just uh, wiring with jumper wires that go onto those posts. So there's literally no soldering. You do not have to be a hardware expert to put this together. I, I knew nothing about electronics before I started this project. And you'll find that it's super interesting and then you'll go like, oh, what if I use an Arduino here? And then you'll get into Arduino and then you're like, oh, I need to be able to, you know, I want to add a proximity sensor so I don't run into things and you'll figure out how to do that. And it, it's, this starts to become endless, right? Getting in is pretty easy, getting out, not that easy. <laughs> okay, so here we are, we've got our camera, we've got our uh, PCA 9685, this little bitty thing here, we've got a Raspberry Pi, uh, that's our motor and that's our servo and underneath there is the, is the electronic speed controller. Okay, so next you need software. So you, you need software in two places. You need software on a host PC. Uh, someone asked a question earlier, um, do, you know, do I do the training on the Raspberry Pi? Do we actually crunch the neural network on the Raspberry Pi? It's not, you can, but it's not powerful enough. It'll take a long time. So basically we use a host PC. A Mac, a Windows, or Linux are all supported. So we have specific instructions for Mac, specific, specific instructions for Windows, and specific instructions for Linux. So you can use any, any one of those as your host PC. And you basically clone the donkey car repo. You set up uh, an Anaconda environment. Uh, that's, we have a YAML file that sets that up for you, and it, it brings in all the necessary dependencies, like TensorFlow and all the things that you need uh, to, um, to be able to use the software. So between Anaconda and PIP, uh, and then if you're using uh, a PC or Linux, then you can install TensorFlow GPU so it can use your GPU on your NVIDIA cards. And um, this is new and still experimental, but you can also use uh, Coral Edge TPU, that's Google's inference accelerator piece of hardware. It's like, uh, it's less than $100. Uh, and, uh, and then make the, make the inference part much, much faster. Okay. Then, uh, then, okay, so that's the host PC. Now you actually have a computer here, so you need to install software here. So you start out with the right operating system. Um, it's, it's an Ubuntu image for a specific Ubuntu image for Jetson Nano that has all the GPU stuff already on it, makes it easier. And, or it's Raspbian for, uh, for the, the Raspberry Pi. So you're gonna boot it and you're gonna set your host name and password. You're gonna do app get to get a whole bunch of dependencies, you're gonna set up a virtual environment, you're gonna install OpenCV, uh, optionally actually, it's, it's, it's only optional. Uh, and you're gonna get clone the repo, and you're gonna, once you get clone the repo, and you, you're gonna create a car. It's, it's essentially a, a, a folder that contains the um, command software to, to tell your car to drive or to train or whatever. So it'll, it'll move software into that. And then on a Raspberry Pi, you just need to be able to make sure that you've, you've enabled the camera, you've enabled the IC2 interfaces and everything like that. And that's a standard, Raspberry Pi config is a standard UI to do that with. It's, it's very easy to do. And again, detailed instructions on, uh, on docs.donkeycar.com. Uh, okay, so now we built our hardware. We've got our software on here, and the thing about, the one thing about these cars is the servos, you know, your motor might work a little bit differently than mine, your servo might not have the same range as mine or might be calibrated slightly differently, and ultimately we want to capture data that's sort of independent of your particular platform. We, we, so when we capture steering, we capture steering from negative one, which is all the way left, to one, which is all the way right. So we normalize the data. It's not actually that real PWM value. So we convert back and forth between PWM. Same thing with throttle. We, we have negative one is all the way forward. One is, is your maximum thrust, which, by the way, you choose. It's somewhat arbitrary. Um, so, so there's a way to calibrate that. 
to give it P specific PWM values to get all the way left or all the way right. Remember those, write it into configuration. Uh, get a calibration value that you feel like is the fastest you want to go. That's your 100% throttle. And then a value that is backwards for you, which shouldn't actually need to be used because we are racing. OK, so now we've calibrated our hardware. Now we, we want to gather the data that we need uh, to calculate the neural network. So um, at its uh, uh, sort of default way that we do things is we use a technique called behavioral cloning. So behavioral cloning is where it's a form of supervised learning where you generate labeled data by recording an expert. So you're all, whenever you, uh, when you're doing uh, supervised learning, you're giving it a data set where you say, this thing that I want to correlate with this data, here's an example of where it's 100% correlated. Here's an example of where it's 100% correlated. And you cr create all these examples, and then the neural network learns that correlation for you. That's a mathematical formula that it learns how to correlate these two things. Well, we need the data. So we just have you drive around with that wireless controller and record you, right? And of course, you're perfect perfect driver, so you would never make a mistake, and no one's going to crash into you, and it should be really awesome. So then you should just be able to move on, except you never can. Uh, because, uh, oh yeah, so, so while you're driving, uh, the data set that it collects is 20 times a second, it takes a picture, and then remembers the input from the, that negative one to one for steering and for throttle that you're giving on the controller, right? So three pieces of data, picture, steering angle, throttle. That's a piece of data. Now you do this and maybe you collect 10,000 pieces of data. Sort of, that's sort of a minimum. So maybe you're driving for 10 minutes, collect. And, uh, and then you're gonna transfer that to your host PC because that's where you're gonna calculate the neural network. Um, when you drive, there's a couple of ways to drive. You can drive, actually, even if you don't have a wireless controller, there's a couple of ways to drive. Uh, by default, when you start to drive, um, the Raspberry Pi uh, runs a web server and gives you this UI. And this area over here, you can use it as an XY pad to go forward and left and right. And it's not that easy to use. The other thing you do that some people do, do did I just say do-do? The other thing that you can do is that you can hook up a wired controller to your uh, host PC where you're looking at that website, and we use the web gamepad UI. And then you can control it with a gamepad from your host PC. So that's another way to do it. You can start that way if you don't want to you know, drop 40 or 50 bucks on a wireless controller. The other thing that you can see in this, uh, uh, in this view is you can see what the car sees. Right, so what the first person view of what the car sees, which is kind of nice. Uh, but if you give it um, the uh, JS argument, then it will presume you have a wireless controller and you could do everything on the controller. You can start it, you can stop it, you can turn it, you can do everything on the controller and you don't need, and it won't even start up a UI if you do that. And that's how most people do it. So while you're driving for data, again, like I said, it's gonna take, it's gonna take a picture. So this is on a straightaway, right? This picture is not high resolution, it's low resolution. This is uh, 160 by 120 pixels. So that's pretty small. Uh, but really, we're just sort of looking for edges. In fact, what we really want to try and have the neural network record, remember is these outer edges and this yellow line. That defines what the track is, right? So, so we take a picture, we remember what your user throttle is, and so here we're on a straightaway, right? So I'm going straight. So my user angle, I should, excuse me, my user angle is zero. I'm just going dead straight. And my throttle is like 0.54. I'm going about half speed now. Uh, and then here's the name of the picture that goes with this piece of data. Okay. And then, you know, going around a corner here, I'm sort of going off to the right there. Now my user angle is 0.49. So I've gotten sort of like halfway over. And I'm going a little bit slower. My, my throttle is only 0.48, and that's that picture. So 10,000 of those. Um, at the last race, I actually had 85,000 uh, pieces of data because I've been doing this for a while, and I've collected a lot of data. Um, so that's in the physical world. You can actually, yes? So does it do how does it, when you choose to get a 16 gig SD card, is it storage? 
Yes, that's actually a piece I left out, thank you. So the question was, what, what would you store this information on? Because you're recording it on the donkey car. And, and uh, the uh, Raspberry Pi and the Nano, you, when you, when I, I mentioned it sort of that side before, that you flash the OS, well you flash it on an SD card. Then you pop the SD card into the Raspberry Pi to boot it, or the, or the Nano to boot it. And that's actually where your recorded data is gonna be on. I would recommend a 32. And I would also recommend that you find one with a write speed of like uh, 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 90 uh, megabytes per second. So typically the cheaper ones are more like 10, 20, or 30. Uh, but you're gonna write a whole bunch of data and you don't wanna get throttled just because you're trying to write data to a slow SD card. So get a relatively fast SD card. Uh, as a matter of fact, on Amazon, there's a Samsung 128 gigabyte SD card that writes 90 megabytes per second and reads 90 megabytes per second, and it's 20 bucks. So why not, right? Um, you can also do this in a simulator. There's a Unity-based simulator that uh, the donkey car team has created, and you can treat it like a real donkey car. It'll use all the same software that you've created on your host PC, but now instead of talking to this real hardware, it's gonna be talking to virtual hardware. So, and there's a number of different tracks. You can train on these various tracks. You can gather that data. You can calculate a neural network and then take that model and have it drive on the simulator. So you, you can do a lot of turns about how to figure out, hey, if I wanted to change this neural network architecture, what would I do, right? Or how would I generalize this more? There's a whole bunch of different kinds of tracks, but I recorded on one, it doesn't work on another, how would I generalize? Uh, so the sim, uh, how much is the, so the question is how much is contrast an issue? Since it's camera based, um, it's a significant issue. So um, it's very sensitive to lighting conditions. And there are more expensive cameras that are less sensitive to lighting conditions. There are, uh, there are some people have experimented with uh, filters to reduce glare. I'll show you an example of why glare is a problem in, upcoming soon. But because it's camera based, I have the exact same problem as Tesla does, which is cameras are subject to lighting conditions. Um, they, and, it's, and it's a significant issue. Um, but there are ways to compensate for that, and I'll, I'll talk about that too. There's ways to make it more general, more resistant to lighting conditions. So nobody's perfect, right? So you, so, um, I know that I'm, I had to do a lot of cleaning on my, of my data. And so we have a uh, donkey car command tub clean that uh, basically shows, uh, shows you your data as a, as a video. And you can grab sections like where you crashed or you went outside the lines or something. Just grab it, delete it, and then save clean data. So now you get data that doesn't have mistakes in it anymore. And that can take a while. There's another mode if you're using the joystick where if you make a mistake, you hit the X button and it just deletes the last 10 seconds. Way faster than having to go back into this UI. Just don't worry about it, delete it. It was only 10 seconds, keep driving. Okay, so training an autopilot. So now we've got our nice clean data. We've driven, we've recorded the expert, right? It's gonna, re it's gonna drive just as well as you. So how do we get it to do that? So, we use the Python manage uh, Pi instead of drive, we use train. We tell it where that recorded data is, and then we tell it the name of the model that we want to output, right? So this, is on the PC or this, this we're probably doing on the PC, right? So the autopilot is trained on the host PC generally. Some people do training uh, on the Jetson Nano because it does have a GPU. And if you don't have a lot of data, then it's an acceptable, uh, way to do it, and that means you don't have to transfer it over. But when you're transferring, if you just zip it up over on your Raspberry Pi or Nano, so it's in a zip file, so it's one file, it's not writing a whole bunch of little files, and then you transfer that, I mean, it's, it's very fast. You could do that too. Uh, I just use uh, SCP. Uh, yeah, I just go over the network, but I zip it up. And once you do that, um, it's not really any smaller, but it's just one, uh, yeah. Yeah, set of, a, set of 10,000, actually it's 20,000 files, right? Because we have a JSON file that has all that information plus the image. So 10,000 samples is 20,000 files. Um, the other nice thing when you do that is you get, uh, you get an archive of your data. So by doing that, you sort of have this workflow which makes you a little bit safe from deleting things. 
Um, so we're going to train on the PC. We've transferred it uh, from the donkey card to the PC. We're going to uh, train. We're going to train. If you have TensorFlow GPU, when it trains, it's going to use the GPU, and that's way, way faster. When I first started doing this, my, my MacBook Air, which wouldn't work here, it didn't do that well on the CNN either. So it, um, it took like two hours to actually crunch the network, which meant my race time came up and my network's not done. I just had to pull a kind of intermediate version of the network and it didn't even get around the, the track. So I was, went out and bought a, you know, a gaming laptop with a good GPU in it. Uh, and now, now literally, from, instead of two hours, it's like uh, six minutes to train. Uh, and uh, the other way that you can do it if you don't want to go buy a laptop is uh, there are Google Collab, there's a Google Collab notebook with all the necessary latest uh, software built into the notebook and you can put that on a GPU instance and also go really fast. Um, so you can, you just got to get the data over onto that instance. Um, so by default, it's going to create a TensorFlow H5, a standard TensorFlow model, but you can also tell it, I want a TF Lite model. TF Lite model is a more efficient model for low power CPUs, um, and that's what I use on mine. It runs very well on a Raspberry Pi. Um, you can also tell it that you want a Tensor RT model if you install the NVIDIA software, and then it's going to use the GPU on the Nano, and then it'll go very fast. And then uh, experimentally, we have Google Coral Edge TPU. We can put the Google Coral Edge compiler on there, and then it quantizes all your parameters to 8-bit values, and that screams. That'll get you like 100 inferences per second instead of 20. It's very, very fast. Yeah, 20 samples a second. Um, you can imagine if you're going really fast, the, the distance that you go in that 1 20th of a second, if it's far, you can drive right off the edge and miss a corner. So the number, the, the, the number of inferences per second that you do is one of the biggest uh, parameters that you need to set. And we set it default to, to use a Raspberry Pi 3B, right? So 20 inferences per second, and we, we only used to have the regular intensive flow models, so that's the best that we could do. But now there's all these, you know, uh, uh, edge level devices for doing inferences like the Nano and the Google Coral TPU, and there's even optimized models for the TF Lite models. And so now we can do a lot better. Uh, well, like I said, on a, on a uh, my, car, my car, which is still at 20 hertz, I haven't upped it yet. I can, I can get this thing to go in the racetrack. I can do like about, about a 12 second lap, but the record is sub six seconds. It's insanely fast, which at scale is somewhere between 150 and 200 miles an hour. So, and it's all controlled autonomously. Yeah. Fast, fast, really, just without anybody else on the track, really faster than a human can get around the track. Uh, and that was only in this last set of races that we sort of broke that record where we got a really fast human to drive around the track and we had a really fast car. Uh, and the car all by itself was a little bit faster than the human. Um, and, and I'll tell you about the final race where we actually pitted human versus robot car and, and how that went. Pretty interesting. So, so we had this question about um, contrast and lighting conditions and everything. There's, a couple, there's a several things you can do to handle uh, issues with your data. Uh, go back to here. I want to show you a couple of things here. So here, you can see in here, look at that above the track. That's the room. That's in my data. So when I first started, when I first calculated my first neural network, and, I, and, I, and no one was in the room, and I trained and everything, and I calculated the neural network, and did great. And then race day came, and the room filled up with people. So this was all legs up here, feet and legs, and it didn't work at all. Because the model, you know, and one of the things about neural networks is you want them to figure out the parameters. You don't want to have to do feature, you don't have to define features yourself. You're hoping that they do it. Well, there's too much detail here. It used the room as an important aspect of the neural network. And therefore, when the room changed, it didn't work. 
So one of the things you can do is we have a way to crop this now. So you can tell it when you calculate the neural network and then when you actually use the model, the subsequent model, ignore, in my case, it was 45 pixels out of the 120 pixels. So just don't use those. Um, the other thing that you can do to handle lighting situations is you can uh, do data augmentation. In data augmentation, we automatically synthesize new data from your current data. We add some noise, some random noise. We shift colors, and we add some false shadows. And we try to take, the, the key thing about data augmentation is, if I were to show you an augmented frame, you would still totally get it, right? It's, you would totally recognize it as a human. We expect the neural network to also recognize it. Right? We're not changing it so it's unrecognizable. We're just changing it a little to add variety. And that helps quite a lot because you try to simulate various lighting conditions. So when you come upon a new lighting condition, you're more likely to be able to handle it. So it makes it more general. And so so the, the question was, did we try actually putting a flashlight on this thing and, uh, and, and turning off the lights? You know, I think I have seen that on, uh, someone posted a video on the community where, where they did that. I haven't done it myself because I'm just trying to do well in the races right now and having a little, one of the things is, you know, I used to have my battery up here, like, and this thing would be like, Ugh. it's very high center of gravity. And then I built this thing to put the battery low and lower the center of gravity. And some people have a car that's only about as high as my wheels super low center of gravity, and they go really fast. Uh, I'm not particularly fast. Um, I was good enough to come in second in the last race in my class, uh, but there's cars out there that just rip. Okay, and the final thing you can do is transfer learning. We've got a, the um, donkey car team has a uh, initiative going. We're collecting a whole bunch of data from different tracks, different kinds of tracks, and cleaning it, putting it together, and then building a base model, and then you, use, you start with that base model, add your data to it, and it should be more general. So when you train the autopilot, the first thing that you look at is you see, hey, how did it do? When, when, when you do uh, training, what it automatically does is it pulls off a piece of the data and saves it. It doesn't train on it. That's called the validation set. And it trains on the rest of the data, and then it checks against data in the validation set to see Am I overfitted or not? Have I, have I created a model that's so specific to just that training data that I couldn't use it in the real world because it's not generalizable enough? And so uh, you can see right down here, uh, this orange line is the validation set, and the, and the blue line is the training set. And the training set has a, a, looks like a lower loss than the validation set. That's an indication that it's, it's maybe a little bit overtrained that I actually have lower loss with my training set than my validation set, you want them to be about the same. And so once I added uh, data augmentation to it, so I added that ability to create these other various kinds of things, now I heard more generality in my data, and you can see here that my validation and training uh, losses are very similar, and this is a good sign. So that's sort of the first thing you look at. Some, sometimes you'll see this thing, and, and if you don't have a lot of data, you know, you'll see that your, your training loss is incredibly low and your validation loss is really high. And that's just a really good indication. This thing's not going to work on a real track. You don't have enough data. Okay, so, so now you want to use it. And suppose you put it on the track and it doesn't sort of work all that well. Like, how do you figure things out? Because it's not like a debugging a program that you can debug, right? Well, there's a few things. We have a command called tubplot, which will, you hand it a bunch of data and then it'll pick a one second chunk out of that data. And then it'll use the model to make predictions for that one second and then plot them against what the real data was. And, and you can, uh, and that's this. So here you can see the, the orange line is the prediction and this top thing is steering. That's why you see like there's right which is up and left which is down. Uh, and so that orange line is the predictions and the blue line is what I really did when I trained. And if you actually look at this, you'll see that orange line doesn't sort of go up to the blue lines on these peaks. It's understeering. It's not steering enough compared to what the human really did. And that actually shows up when the autopilot drives. And there's ways that I can deal with that by scaling the values that come out of the, the, the inference 
and just like bump them up a little, make it 110%. Right? So there's ways that I can potentially deal with that, but I wouldn't know unless I did this plot, right? And then uh, this is the throttle. So you don't ever see negative here because I'm racing and I'm not backing up. I don't record backup data. And so in this case, it's just the opposite. That orange line is a prediction, and it's predicting a higher throttle than what I actually gave it. And again, I can handle that by scaling that a little. Maybe I scale my throttle values to 90% of what the, the model's telling me. But the reason I can do that is because I have this nice plot and I can analyze the data. Now the other thing to look at is uh, the activations in the network, where what, what parts in the network are being uh, emphasized when it makes an inference, right? And so what you do there is you run this CNN activations thing and you give it an image and you give it the model. And then it will run the model against the image and it'll pay particular attention to where the activations was and then it'll create an image for you to show you. So in this particular case, you can see it's nice. It's like it, got, it, it found that line, it found the middle line, it found that line. This is just middle and this is what the steering angle was. So this is sort of proportional to the throttle, this green line, and that's proportional to the uh, steering angle. So it's not, uh, that's not data that it's looking at. It's just trying to help you understand what your inputs were when you were looking at this thing. So this is pretty nice, right? It's learned the lines. And it's not paying much attention to this stuff that doesn't matter. It's not paying attention to the wall over here, for instance, where the, where the rug meets the wall. Uh, which is the particular issue I had. Um, but here we are in another one, and here there's some glare on, on the, there's glare on the track. And look at that, I mean, it's really paying attention to that. Right? The glare's really throwing it off. Um, so this is a good indication that you might have a problem on this track with this lighting condition. And you wanna maybe do something about it, make sure you do, if, you, this, if they weren't using data augmentation when, when they built this model, Try data augmentation and try to reduce, uh, reduce the um, overfitting on glare. Okay, so now we've figured out our optimal autopilot, right? Now we actually want it to drive all by itself. So what do we do? So again, we use the Python manage command. Ooh. We use the Python manage command and we tell it drive. And we give it the model now. And in my case, I give it the JS argument so because I'm just going to drive just with the joystick. I can start it and stop with the joystick. The nice thing about this is there's a command to start it uh, with the joystick, and it'll go into autopilot, and then if things go off the rails, you put it back in manual mode, and you have to just you drive it back to you. Um, the other thing that you can do in this mode is you can set up, in race mode, you can set up, uh, uh, you can set up, you can set it up so that it has, uh, it just like, flies off the line at like 200% throttle for like two seconds, right? Just to get off the line and get ahead and then switches back into AI mode. Uh, so launch mode, like launch mode just like a Ferrari or, or a Tesla. <laughs> yeah, insane mode. Uh, so uh, by default, it's gonna start the web server and you would control it through the web server. You'd say, you know, start, use the AI and start driving through the web server. I would recommend the, the the joystick, it's, it's much better. So what's it doing when it's driving? So remember when we recorded the data, da data sorry, it's my Bostonian coming back. Uh, when we recorded the data, we, we, we got an image and we got steering angle and throttle. And then we used 10,000 of those or more and we calculated our neural network. So, so now we wanna drive. So the driving loop goes like this. When you first put the car into drive mode, it initializes the hardware, so it does things like uh, make sure that the, uh, this PCA9685 board is online and working, make sure that the camera's warmed up and is ready to start giving you images, does a few things like that. And then if you said, I'm driving in autopilot mode, then it's gonna load in your model that you gave it with that dash dash model argument. So it loads your TensorFlow model into memory. Now it's gonna enter this vehicle loop. In the Python software, is different than like ROS, like uh, the robot operating system. It's one data pipeline. It's not event driven where things are talking to each other with events. It's a data pipeline where things write things to, a, to, memory, to tagged memory slots and read them from tagged memory slots. So basically you're, you're just using a, like a hash map kind of thing where, so, um, so the first thing you do is you go clear that hash map, right? 
And then the next thing you do is you grab a camera image and you write it to that hash map. And the name of that, uh, you generate the, 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 the image name. And remember, I showed you that little piece of data. So it's going to get that name. Now, if it's a human pilot, then you're going to read the steering and throttle from the joystick. And you're going to convert that to negative 1 to 1, negative 1 to 1, based on that configuration that you created at the beginning when you calibrated your car. So now, now you've got a picture and your steering angle of throttle. If you're on autopilot, then what you're going to do is take that image and you're going to submit it to the neural network. And the neural network is going to come back and say, here's what I think steering angle is, and here's what I think throttle should be. Based on what I'm seeing, here's what I think they should be. So now, in that case, I also have image, steering angle, throttle. Um, <clears throat> now I'm going to take the steering angle and throttle, whether I got them from the human or whether I got them from the AI, and I'm going to Using your uh, calibration, I'm going to convert those into those PWM values, and I'm going to put those in the hardware. Now the car steers based on the PWM value and sets its throttle based on the PWM value. Um, and then if I'm recording data, like I was driving around a human recording data, I'm going to write that image throttle steering uh, off to data. And now I'm going to go to the top again, clear data, do the same thing. So you can see when I'm in autopilot mode, what happens is, Grab that image, ask, submit it to the neural network, get throttle steering, put it in the hardware, go back up there again. It just constantly does that. Take a picture, get steering angle, put it in the hardware, do it. And think about what it's doing there. I haven't trained it to stop. It just keeps going, no matter what. And I haven't, right now, trained it to avoid anything. You just step in front of it, it's going to hit you. So. Um, so it's, this is end-to-end -end neural network control of an autonomous vehicle. That's not really how they do it in, 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 in professional autonomous vehicles, which is a good idea because it's sort of hard to understand what's going on in a neural network, so you want a little bit more control. You would like to be able to step through and debug. Uh, but for this, it's a really great introduction, and it's really uh, interesting to get it uh, up and going pretty quickly, and you can learn a lot about neural networks. So that's what that, that's what that loop is. And then you give it a command, you say, I'm done, it shuts down all the hardware, it's done. So that's driving on autopilot. OK, so what can you do with it? Well, the first thing you want to do with it is you want to go race. So there's a group uh, called DIY Robocars. And they're dedicated to grassroots innovation and autonomous technology. And in the Bay Area, they uh, host a, at Circuit Launch in Oakland, which is over in Edgewood, uh, Edgewater Drive, by the airport, they host, four times a year, they host a race. And it's gotten very popular. And companies like NVIDIA have showed up, uh, Intel has showed up, AWS has shown up. They're very interested in this community. Um, uh, and so we have this race once a quarter. Now, there's chapters all over the country, actually all over the world. Last weekend, uh, the chapter in Seoul, Korea, uh, was at the Maker Fair in Seoul, Korea, uh, and had a whole track at, in Seoul. Um, in uh, Shenzhen, China, we've had uh, events. Uh, it's all over the world. Um, uh, in Dusseldorf, we've had events. There's, there's been events in lots of different places around the world, um, and, and most of them are based on Donkey Kong. Uh, so, so, here's, so here I'm going to race. I'm going to show you uh, my the first uh, uh, the first round uh, that I was involved in, we had the race about uh, four weeks ago, uh, five weeks ago. And so this is the first race. So I've optimized the car. I've got it awesome. So I practice. It goes around great. I'm going to kick some butt. And I'm racing against another donkey car. One of the other committees, Rahul has his car, looks a lot like mine. And the reason we were paired is because we go about the same speed, because it's almost the exact same car. So here we go. <laughs> That's my car up there. That was round one. 
so the issue there was exactly like I have it here. Like, it's a camera. It's the only sensor, right? I left the lens cap on it. <laughs> so it just saw black. And you know, the, the, the race is mostly right turns. So it was like, black, I just go right. <laughs> OK, so we reset after that. And generously, they, they let us start again. Uh, and this is the second race. So the other car was disqualified. <laughs> okay, but good news. I made it around one lap cleanly. That qualified me. That's the first time I ever qualified. <laughs> and and uh, Rahu was disqualified because he cut the cone. You can go outside because sort of an automatic penalty. You're taking a slow route. but. Uh, uh, but here's what a real car does. This is also a donkey car, same software stack, custom-built car. And, it, and, and Mark here also races RCs. So when he behavioral clones, he clones the behavior of a really good RC racer. Plus, he knows how to build a, build a nice, uh, nice car. So here's what it looked like when, when his car went. So his first lap smashed the record. It was a seven second lap about. Smashed the record. And he ended up winning that race. That was, two bef bef that was the one before the most recent one. And uh, he smashed the record so much because he's such a good driver and he cloned himself. And uh, Chris Anderson, the, the, the DIY Robocars and the host of the, uh, the thing realized, hey, we've hit, sort of hit the limits. We don't want it to be about the driver anymore, right? We want it to be about algorithms. We want you to innovate algorithms. So in the last race, we changed it so that there's random obstacles, and you always race against another car. So there's a moving obstacle and static obstacles, and it makes it that much harder. Uh, so we got to the place where humans got so good, we had to change the rules. So um, oh, I didn't put that slide in here. But, but um, over the period of the last three years, the best time for a car has gone from about 40 seconds a lap to under six seconds a lap. And it's faster than a human can drive around that lap. I, I mean, they've gotten insane, like really, really fast. And so in just three years, we've, we've, and honestly, three years ago, hardly anybody made it, like two cars would make it around the track. And now almost everybody does. So what can you do with it? Well, all the source code's there. So you can dig into the source code and see how this thing works. And then you can experiment it with it. You can add new sensors. People have added proximity sensors. People have added LIDAR. People have added stereo cameras. Um, you can create new models. There's actually a number of experimental models. We have uh, a 3D model that takes multiple frames. Uh, we have a model that takes the input from uh, an inertial measurement unit, so uh, you know accelerometers and gyroscope. Um, and so there's a lot of things you can do with it at, at the software stack level. And again, we have these new challenges of being able to recognize the obstacles and plan a path around them. Donkey Car right now does not address that directly. You could try to address that in training. But now they, if they throw one more thing at you, now you have to have yet more combinations of training data. And just training a neural network starts to become intractable. And you have to think about doing something else. So that's another place that you could, uh, you could do some good in the software. Um, there's people that have created, there's people that have created uh, reinforcement learning using that simulator. And reinforcement learning is a kind of learning where you use a reward function. And then it just tries to try to randomly do stuff. And the stuff that's good gets rewarded. And stuff that isn't gets eliminated. And you build up good, good, good until you can actually do the thing. And actually, AWS's Deep Racer, um, which they created after Donkey Car was at one of their AWS summits. Then they created Deep Racer, and theirs is all about reinforcement uh, learning. And to date, reinforcement learning doesn't work anywhere as, as good as what we're doing in Donkey Car, but there's no, 
no reason to believe that it couldn't get very good. The other thing you can do with it, people do right now teach with it. Uh, colleges, I, colleges use it in their, do we have colleges that use it in their robotics programs, including some of the UCs. Uh, high schools use it as STEM projects, get students interested in, interested in STEM. There's a lot of things going on in here. Um, and if you're interested in that, go to our discourse group, um, and there's a whole thread all about using donkey in education. Uh, and many, many companies use it at events, especially technology companies, to get their sort of engineers interested in build, doing te building teams around building these cars and racing these cars. And as I said before, uh, Donkey Car actually was used at an AW, uh, AWS Summit event, and out of that came AWS's Deep Racer. And that's it. Thank you for listening.